Hello everyone, welcome to episode 17 of Night Call. You thought that this was going to be another funny episode of Overcooked or something else? No, you're wrong. Life's not always fun. Still people dying in France. It's like our last two cases didn't happen. So today we are going to tackle the last case of Night Call. And let's see what is trying to kill us this time. So, it's the Sandman this time. Victims may feel random at first, but there's a connection. Okay. So, we are still gonna go with balanced. And I guess we all know how this will go, so I'm just gonna skip a lot on this first day because everything's the same. The one the media are calling the Sandman shot you before escaping. Oh, we're being shot again? No, I don't need any explanation. I know my taxi. It's like I've been here before, two times. Okay, okay, get out. I want to work. Um, you can count on me, whatever. This guy again. Is it the womanizer or is it Carlo? I think it's not Carlo. I think it's the other guy. Um, we don't know her yet. So, change of plans. I'm just gonna talk to everyone that I haven't met before, so... I hate it when there's blank pictures in the Pasadex when you can't collect everything, so... And after this will be our last case, I at least want to meet some new people. So yeah, you're going to the 17th, we can do that. The door opens and your next passenger, a woman, jumps into the back seat. Rue de Lévis. Her voice is shaking, her mind is elsewhere. Please. You start driving. In the rearview mirror, you notice your passenger is shivering. She's clenching a rose in her hands, like it might otherwise fly away. Um, you want me to turn the heat up? She doesn't hear your question. Insists. Miss? Uh, no. No? No, I said no. No heat? Finally she looks at you. He asked me to marry him and I said no. He had everything planned. He put the ring in my champagne flute and I said no. She blinks her eyes very slowly. I don't know why I said no. Why? Her expression becomes scornful, aggressive. You don't want to get married? No, I mean, no, I... She's almost frozen. Some time goes by. She's like a freeze frame, a movie on pause. I want to get married. I always dreamed of a wedding, of the kind of life. Her head wobbles. Her elegant facial features cloud over briefly. I think. She looks back quickly. Her voice breaks. I have to go back to the restaurant. Getting married is what I've always wanted. <laughs> so why did I say no? You get the impression she's shrinking. She looks tiny and fragile in the rearview mirror. Shit. Shit, I just said shit. You did. Her face looks like she's just been in a brutal accident. That's not nice. We have to turn around now. Are you... Okay, okay. are you sure? I, I don't know, I'll just go there. Thanks, I... But she decides not to finish her sentence after all. As soon as you can, you turn around. In the backseat, your passenger can't bear to look at you. She studies her hands instead. You drive on in silence. It's strange, but you like that odd feeling of going back over the same road. Everything seems so different. The buildings have a different perspective. You see them in new and unexpected light. The passers-by are no longer the same. They've been replaced by others. The lights are on a different cycle, like they know you're coming back. A few seconds later, without even noticing the ground you'd covered, you pull over in front of the restaurant that you just came from. She throws you a shy, almost indiscernible smile. Can I ask you a favor? You nod slowly. Uh, don't ever repeat what I said. Who exactly do you think I would tell? I would like to know. 
Or your colleagues, your friends, your wife, who the hell knows? Not a word about... She can't finish her sentence. Not a word. And in a whisper, she adds, Thanks. She pays her fare, gets out of the cab, walks up to the restaurant. She's trying to catch someone's eye. She stands like that for a minute on tiptoe, her head leaning towards the dining room. Then she walks into the restaurant. Her rose is left behind in the doorway. I want to wait a while. I want to see how this goes. Another minute to think about her beautiful gown, her words, how she shook. Getting married. For a second you try to remember your own marriage proposal. It all seems so far away. So very far away. And you turn the key in the ignition and drive away. Aw. I wanted to know. Is she getting married now or not? Do we know her? Do we know her? Oh, I forgot everyone. I'm gonna go there. We definitely don't know her. I think. I hope. Camille Antoine. I think we don't know her. Your next passenger has barely gotten in a cab when she tells you where she wants to go in a frank and determined voice. You start driving, she's glancing around the cab and taking notes. How's your evening going? Your passenger doesn't reply and continues to examine your taxi. She runs her finger over the cloth of the back seat. Sniffles the seat belt. Oh, is she an inspector? Is she looking at our taxi? We never drove a cat, just so you know. That must have been in an alternate universe. Opens and closes the window over and over. Can I help you? Your young passenger doesn't even raise her head as she replies icily. Is that how you speak to all your passengers? She hangs on the last words of her sentence like she's letting the last syllable slowly escape her lips. I talk to my passengers however I want. When they're unpleasant, yes. Hey, I just asked her nicely if I can help her, so what is rude about that? I don't know. I'm just gonna tell her she's unpleasant. She sniffed my seat belts. Doesn't appear she heard your reply. Hm. Do you think the quality of your vehicle has an influence on your numbers? Um, no, the passengers couldn't care less. I think so. She cuts you off. I need a yes or no answer. The last word slides up with an imaginary question mark. It's still resonating in a cap when she starts her next sentence. It will make analyzing the data from my questionnaire easier. <laughs> no! Okay, then I'll just gonna nod my head. Good, let's move on. She takes a minute to write down your reply. Good. Do you think you could drive for more than 12 hours a day? No. You look at her in the rearview mirror. Uh, no, there's no way. I mean, probably you could, but it would be really dangerous, so I'm just gonna go with no, there's no way. She doesn't even listen to the end of your reply. What about 16 hours? Oh well, yeah, 16 hours will work for me. 12, nah, but 16, yeah. Driving 16 hours? Your brain fixates on her upspeak. Hours? You shake your head. 16 hours... hours straight? 16 hours. Yes or no? Uh... I... no. She sighs softly, as if she were disappointed. Would you be prepared to learn massage techniques as part of your taxi service? Massage. Answer the question. Uh, no, I have to drive. She groans. That's inconvenient. What about learning basic psychotherapy? Uh, yeah, why not? Good, 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 good. Her eyes land on the next question. She lets out a little, oh. This one's prickly. Her voice makes your skin crawl. You dig your fingernails into the leather of your steering wheel. Would you be prepared to learn how to make coffee and mix cocktails? You remain silent for a moment. I... She cuts you off. A yes or no answer. Uh... In the taxi? Yeah, that was my question. In the taxi? 
obviously. Where else would you do it? Hmm. She rolls her eyes dramatically. It's so fake it looks like she's doing mime or in theater classes. My idea is based on a very simple concept. People take taxis in the morning, midday, at night. What if you offered them coffee on their way to work? Croissants. What if at noon, between two meetings, they could eat a nice hot meal comfortably seated on the cushy back seat of a taxi? And in the evening, nighttime. Why not have a cocktail before your evening out at the theater or the movies, even before clubbing? She stops herself. You can tell she's restless. You sigh. Good thing you're not far from your destination. So? Well, basically it's not a bad idea, but... I mean, serving food and drinks in a normal cab is kind of complicated because you can't do it as a driver. You would need a second person on, I don't know, maybe the passenger seat. But how are you going to hand someone in the back seat something to drink or something to eat? Or how are you going to prepare it in a car if it's just a car? I mean, if it's like a bus or something, maybe. But I don't know. I think it's an interesting idea. So I'm just going to applaud the idea. Hey, she's trying to make something better, so she's got ideas. Okay, it's a good idea. I'm sure some folks will be interested. Some folks? Oh no, it's going to be huge. I'm bringing slow food and fast-paced life together in a familiar mobile environment. Is a taxi so familiar? It's a whole new way of life. I call it... She makes a dramatic pause. The mobile home. She waits impatiently for your answer for several minutes. You don't budge. So? Um, it already exists. Maybe not in a taxi, though. It already exists. She raises her hand to silence you. I know, I know. The term exists. But who cares? That's what disruption is about. Using the old to create something new. Your mind fixates on the never-ending raised syllable. You aren't listening to what she's saying anymore. <laughs> That's not nice. You've almost reached your destination. You bite your cheek every time you hear that noise from the back of her throat. Finally, after what seemed like forever, you pull up in front of your passenger's address. She's surprised to discover you're already there. Ah. Time flies with you. That's a very important skill, you know. Knowing how to make good conversation is essential. She smiles at you. I suppose you don't accept cryptocurrency. No, I'll take hard, normal, euro cash. Uh, cash or credits, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she pays her fare, taking notes all the while. You should invest in a faster credit card terminal. You could save so much time. She gets out of the car. You hear her continue to talk as she walks around the car. And why not put some money into a more striking color? Something that lets people know it's you right away. I see pale lavender or an unusual orange. Fluorescent, maybe. Oh, wow. She steps up onto the sidewalk and after one last wave, she finally leaves. You stay quiet for a moment. Just something, something is at the back of your mind. Nothing very happy. But at least the notion that you serve a purpose on this planet. I mean, she had some interesting ideas. And who could that be? Okay, we've got our new suspect. And what the hell? The one that we just drove as our suspect. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so who are suspects? I didn't read the reports yet. I just want to take a look at the suspects first. So, Geraldine Semour, an ex-partner of Group Diamant, recently fired from the board. Good physical state, lost her dad a year ago, did her military service in Israel, knows how to handle a gun, anger management issues, assaulted a cop a few months ago. Huh. Or did she assault a cop for several months going on? Assaulted a cop a few months. He just, she just followed him around a few months and insulted him. Or assaulted. Okay. So, Camille, we just drove her. She's the one who's trying to convince us to serve coffee in our taxi. She's an entrepreneur, heir of the fourth victim, young, fit, good physical state, anger management issues, attacked by a ca attacked a cop the day of the first killing, never arrested, blurry past, lives in a studio owned by her family and the group Diamant. 
Okay, so I think the Goop Diamant has something to do with it, and everyone seems to have anger management issues so far. Christophe Clerouin, a young drifter, dropped out of school, average physical state, arrested but always released, minor at the time, reasons unknown, no known address in Paris, suspected to steal unlocked cars, possible use of drugs. So it seems like the physical state of the suspects is important in this case. So Anita Ventimiglia, CEO of Group Diamant, owner of the Albatross building, excellent physical state, has been difficult to investigate, have friends in high places, described as a shark by rivals and friends, <laughs> ruthless and ready for anything. Father was linked to the Corsican mafia. Okay, and Alexandre Leclerc. Retired mailman, good physical state, despite his alcoholism, lost his grandson in the Albatross fire a few months ago, was one of the more vocal protesters after the Albatross fire. Attacked Anita Ventimiglia during a protest, she never pressed charges. Hmm. Okay, so except for him, I mean, hey, we need to point out that in this case, RV isn't one of the suspects, so hey. Congrats to that, RV. But it seems like four of our five, um... Suspect has something to do with this group diamant. Okay, but we were going we're going to read something and we can read everything today. Nice. So is it just me or did we have like in the in the first case we had a lot more things to read or it took a longer time? So I think in the first night we we weren't able to read everything. Oh, okay. So that's surprisingly little evidence that we can that can be connected to one person in particular. It's interesting. Okay. So who do we have here? Oh, okay. This one. Geraldine lost her company to Group Diamant. Okay. Yeah. An ex-partner. Yep. Victim number one, burn marks on the body done while alive. Victim one's usual MO similar to albatross fire. Victim number one was an arsonist. Victim number two st was strangled post-mortem. Alexander's grandson died in the albatross fire. Yeah, we know that. Anita's husband is a dentist with access to muscle relaxant. Okay. Victim number one used to work with the Mafia. Victim number one thought to be a suicide at first. Really? Would he have burned himself before he killed himself? Tears found in victim two. Maybe killer? Huh. Okay. So that doesn't really give us a lot now. Here we have victim number one. So it seems like someone paid victim number one back for him being an arsonist in a way be because he had burn marks on the body that were done while he was alive. Although that could also be because he was an arsonist. Maybe he had some scars because he burned himself while setting fire to other stuff. I don't know. Is that a thing? Victim number one's usual M.O. Oh, okay, I see, I understand now. He could be the one who set fire to this albatross building that is her property, and it's the place where his grandson died. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, we can't say anything about this at the moment, so let's just end the night. But I wonder what places we can visit tomorrow to ask some questions. I hope I don't screw them up like I did the last time in the church. Okay, so we just drove our first victim. Uh, not our victim, we just drove our first suspect. Hey, and here's our second suspect. Hello there. That's Anita, I think. Yes. So then, let's ask her. Maybe she will tell us something. Maybe she's a crazy person too.
You pull up in front of La Pierre, a starred restaurant you've heard a lot about. Yeah, last case, one of our suspects worked there. Two women are waiting out front, standing ways apart. The first is one of your suspects. You recognize her face right away. She's connected to the hedge fund that managed the Albatross, the apartment building that burned down. The second woman you've never seen before. She's wearing pajamas. She has a dumb smile on her face. The hu they hug each other goodbye in an oddly distant way. The first leans over to your window. We're going in two different directions. Cold, blunt voice. You can tell by her tone she's trying to impress the other woman. I'm going to Saint-Germain and she's going to Etoile, Avenue de la Grande Armée. Both women look at each other. The one wearing pajamas raises her hand. Go ahead. I see another taxi at the end of the street. Don't worry about me. Go. Geraldine, wait. Isn't she another one? Okay, gotta remember the name, Geraldine. <laughs> she turns to her friend. Is that okay with you? No worries. Call me? Of course. Let me think about your offer. Oh, are they conspiring something? Your suspect gets into the cab. Your next passenger gets in and you start driving away from the restaurant. Your passenger turns around, trying to catch her friend's eye, the one she left behind on the sidewalk. She sighs a very strange sigh. It's horrible. Just horrible. <laughs> the restaurant? Your friend doesn't look well. What is? I was talking about... She realizes she was talking out loud and freezes. There's a short moment of silence. She looks at you closely and decides you must be trustworthy. You've always been a people person. You see it as a sort of superpower. My friend, what's happening to her is just horrible. She's not doing well. She's in a bad way. Doesn't know what to do anymore. She was telling me about her new idea, her new business plan, but it's obvious she's at the end of her rope. I helped her build a future for her business and she burst into pieces just like that huge blimp way back when... It's horrible, especially since... Her voice fades out for a second, floats in mid-air. Especially since? She shakes her head. Especially since she's an incredible woman, or rather was incredible. Incredible, I'm telling you. She had kids separated from her idiot husband, built a franchise from nothing, or practically nothing. She's really a role model for me, I'm not kidding. I was successful because my parents had money, because I went to the best schools. She, on the other hand, has been working like mad since she was 16 years old. She freezes. The way her father ran his business was disastrous, utterly disastrous. Something crosses her line of vision. She appears to perk up. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. You try to find something to say, but she continues without paying any attention to you. Have you ever been in a situation where someone you absolutely adore makes one bad decision after another? She doesn't wait for an answer and keeps talking. Well, the woman you saw earlier is just that person for me. She keeps going, using words you're not accustomed to. You hunt for some short clue of in her pleasant voice. She suddenly bursts out laughing, more of a sardonic snicker, really. She had her hands on a gold mine and she let it all go. All of it. I had no choice but to fire her. I'm not proud of myself, but the company's well-being has to come first. She was the one who fired her, but they're still friends? She pauses, apparently out of necessity. She got this crazy idea in her head. She wanted to go back to the original size. Those are the words she used, original size. You pull into your passenger street. She doesn't notice and keeps talking. How am I supposed to explain that to the stockholders, to the investors who call in, wanting to expand to South America, Asia, Abu Dhabi? You shrug as you pull up in front of her building. Time flies. In the blink of an eye, she pays her fare with bills that look so fresh you'd think they'd been printed the night before. She's about to open the door when she turns to you. Her eyes bore into you like she's examining you. It's strange, I get the feeling I've seen you somewhere before, and I never forget a face. Did you kill me? Time grows sluggish. She reaches towards a hip, unbuckles her seatbelt. It's her. Her face relaxes. No, no, forget it. It's in my head. I probably drank a bit too much this evening. Best of luck for the rest of your shift. A second later, she's outside and the door closes. You start breathing again. You hear the sound of her heels banging on the sidewalk. She walks up to the entrance of her building, turns around and looks at you. I'm gonna stay. Or will you murder me then? You don't budge. She stands there watching you for a while, her eyes give off a vague shimmer in the night. A car flies by, somewhere above you a metal shutter bangs. 
She eventually goes into her lobby. She doesn't turn on the light. You turn the key in the ignition and notice you're shaking nervously. You leave her street behind. Okay, so was that our killer? I don't know. She could also be just this tough businesswoman. Although, I mean, she would have a reason to kill the killer of her property. I don't know. Leia Graia. I need to go to San Juan. Okay. We can do that. I have to say, we never had money problems since the first case. It's interesting. Your next passenger does not simply get in, she throws herself in. Energetic, lively, chatty, she looks like she never stops. She gives you her address and, have, and heaves a big sigh. You start driving. Would you mind putting on some music? Um, she looks like a cultural type, I don't know. An Ethiopian jazz tune starts up. Your young passenger leans jerkily over to you, then... She stops and lets herself go with the music. Okay, I think I made the right choice. You like listening to the station every once in a while. The playlist is random, unusual, and surprising. Some of the stuff they play, you can't stand. Some of it drives passengers nuts. <laughs> then there's nothing magical about discovering new tunes, new styles. All of a sudden, your passenger taps you on the shoulder and pulls you from your thoughts. Hey, can I ask you something? She doesn't wait for an answer. Do you think that people have faces that go with their personalities? By that you mean? Well, yeah, yeah, you know, when the dudes that look like weasels turn out to be traitors. Or like the sexy blondes are inevitably superficial. Uh, I see what you mean. Like they wear their personalities on their faces. It's possible, I guess. She pauses. She scans your face like she's trying to determine your personality. I think it's possible. That's what I said. She starts speaking quicker and quicker. I saw a really weird movie tonight, a black and white one, crazy old. Directed by Hitchcock, this famous British guy. The female lead steals money on a job. She opens her eyes wide. But like $40,000 or something, which must have been worth a whole lot at the time. So she goes to hide out in a motel, the owner's a bit precious. His name is Norman, so with that kind of name you know something's wrong from the start, right? Before you can provide an answer, she's moved on. And then she gets slaughtered in the shower with this big knife. Oh, nice. Insane. They kill off the main character after, what, half an hour? There's blood everywhere. Of course you can't see anything. Old movies never show anything. You never even see it when people kiss. Yeah, so anyway, the dude who owns the motel, he so completely looks like a murderer. And she goes right there, gets a room, has dinner with him, they chat. No big shock when he slices her up. She pauses, silence fills the cab. It's like the rest of the story is missing, like your passenger is struggling to say something. And? You experience... <laughs> Did you steal money? No, you experience something like that? Well, yeah. I broke up with my boyfriend last night. It wasn't serious or anything, but when I met him right away, I was like, shit, this guy just looks like a liar. <laughs> Don't know why, it's just what I thought at the time. She pauses when she starts speaking again, her voice is filled with anger. And I was right, he totally played me, he's got some other chick in Village Weave. It sucks, because this guy knows a ton about movies, right? He showed me some stuff, real films. There was one, a masked killer, like in Scream, who murders teens at camp. Like, they're totally getting it on, and here comes the killer carrying a harpoon, and bam, he slaughters both of them in one fell swoop. She giggles. The crazy thing is that the killer's actually some kids, like seven years old or something. So good. Yeah, so this guy I was with, he said he knew people in the industry, he said he could totally help me get an internship or something like that. Oh, okay. Totally lies too, probably. There's nothing you can do with liars, real, patholo real pathological ones. They believe all their lies. Can't tell the truth from the lies anymore. Something is not right in his head. Your young passenger taps her thigh. Man, I say some really stupid shit, don't I? Like, I'm trying to make excuses for that asshole. You're not far from her place now. She slowly calms herself down. The dude in the motel, in the film, obviously he was the murderer. Dressed up as his mom that he turned into a mummy. She pauses. He was pretty fucked up. She stares at you in the rearview mirror as you park. And you? <laughs> are fucked up too. No, um, who do I look like? Hard to say. Your beard hides most of your face, but you look like... Cool. I, I mean, detached. Yeah, detached. Like the world, everything around us, like it's not really your place, you know? Like you're just passing through. 
She flashes you a smile. Don't take it the wrong way. I'm just saying detached and cool in a good way. No worries. She looks down. Well, apparently we are something not from this world because we keep reliving the situation but with different killers. What's going on here? Phew, I didn't want to hurt your feelings. She hands you her fare. Thank you. A second later, she's outside. You watch her walk across the parking lot and up the doors of her building. Once she's inside, you drive away. She was a funny character. Oh, it's either Kruki or this guy. We have known everything from Kruki, right? Or is there more to him? No, we already met Kruki. Everything there is to know about him. Didn't I drive him so many times already? I doubt that his stories change. It was to talk about protesting again, so nothing new here. Dark. Oh, that's the that's the pastor. I know. Okay. Um, I'm gonna drive her. Uh, because I can't remember anything about her. I just remember that. No, I don't remember anything. It just says that we met her, but I don't know what that means. I don't know what we talked about. I want to drive Santa again. Okay, yeah, it's the same conversation. She's the, she's our very first passenger, I think. His accident? That's right. He was supposed to meet his father for a rugby match. He was in a hurry. He tried to pass a truck on the right as he was leaving the highway. The driver didn't see him. The voice trails off. Oh, that's too bad. I don't know how he managed it not to die on a spot. It's really tough. And all that just to see a rugby match. Her smile is playful, full of life. I mean, ever since he was little, I tried to get him interested in soccer. And see what happened. The smile of dry amusement flickers across your passenger's face. Anyway, he's been in a coma for a few weeks now. Great too, not a total vegetable, but not all that hardy either. Okay, we already know that again. His place? Yeah, I can't stand going to rehab anymore. You should see how they treat people there, it's the worst unit. And comas can go on like that for months, no change. Luckily, the head doctor... Your client begins mechanically tapping her fingers on her leather pants. You can hear the dull tap 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 sound. Let's just say he has a hard time saying no to me. And that I thought my little Titouan would be just as well off in his own bed with his girlfriend there to take care of him, seeing she doesn't work and all. But it's a little much for Cruz, of course, so I'm helping out. Cruz is his girlfriend? His fiance, a lovely girl. Your passenger puts her hand to her mouth to smother a giggle. Okay, yeah, we already know that again. You unfold the handkerchief, you see the word Patricia and a phone number written inside. What? You look up at the building and smile. What? She, did she just drop us or her number? You notice a newspaper on the back seat. Your last passenger must have left it behind or the one before. What? She just left her phone number? Ooh. So what I just realized is that our only point of interest is here. That's the only question we can ask. There is nothing really, there is no one really of interest here. I don't want to drive Annabelle again. It's always the same and Santa's probably going to be the same too and him, I don't know. He's just boring. Uh, I'm just going to read a newspaper maybe. <laughs> Mobile home. Oh, yay, she made it. You sigh. You turn the page and stop. You've read about a third of the newspaper. Yeah, keep reading. It's a rather positive critique of a bar called Solil. Oh, so if we drive that vampire lady again, I don't know. You make note of the information. Okay, only have third. Yeah, read the whole thing, why not? It's an article about inheritance and wealth in France. They mention Henri Dutilleux. The journalist explains why the execution of his will has been blocked since his murder. 
It makes you think the information doesn't go so well with the theory that the killer killed for money. Huh. You shut the paper, it'll end up in the trash tonight. Oh wait, he's our he he's a suspect. We're gonna drive him. But she's too, isn't is or is she not? I don't know. What does he tell us? Since we already, ha since we only have one point of interest, I think it would be best to talk to the suspects as much as possible. You park in front of the cemetery where your client is supposed to be waiting. Oh, he visits his grandson. No one is there. A bit further, you notice a small house half built into the cemetery wall. A door opens, light floods the street. You make out two shadows. One of them walks towards your cab, your next passenger. He struggles to get into the car and eventually falls onto the back seat. Evely. A moment goes by before you realize he's giving you his address. His raspy and exhausted voice was almost inaudible. You start driving. You leave the cemetery and notice another shadow in the rearview mirror still standing on a sidewalk. Who was that? Your passenger slowly lifts his head up. You're stuck, struck by the smell. The stench of alcohol is so strong you'd think your passenger had bathed himself in a river of whiskey. You know you're not going to be able to get rid of the smell easily. It was the cemetery watchman. Great guy, yeah. Your passenger's shaking, a spit bubble forms at the corner of his mouth. Too hard. It's just too hard. Each word he says is uttered with a moan and pain. His face, twisted and almost inhuman, makes you uncomfortable. What's going on? He's my grandson. I miss him so much. Every minute, every second I'm away from him. You know why he's there, but you can't give him the impression you recognize him. You'd give away the fact you know things about him. And this old guy who reeks of alcohol is a killer. What happened? She didn't read the papers, huh? A fire, a hundred some dead. Ring a bell? Yes, yes, of course. My grandson was in the building. My little man, Daniel. Precious kid. Rosy cheeks to pinch, always asking questions, question after question. Asking questions about everything all the time. He once asked me if whales... He lowers his head, shaking all over. He's unable to speak. Say nothing and turn the heat up. Hot air spews into the cab. After a few minutes driving, you can tell your passenger has calmed down. He's shaking less. The roads fly by, the avenues, the boulevards, too. When you reach your destination, your passenger abruptly points to a window on the top of the floor of a dilapidated building. You pull up. Here. I live here. It's all I can afford. Till they're able to relocate her, my daughter is living in a hotel, out in the projects, seedy place. He paused and remains completely still. Can't seem to sleep at my place. All I can do is... A smile appears on his face, his voice becomes softer, almost sweet. I slip into the cemetery where Dan is buried. I climb the wall, I avoid the gravel walkways, I snuggle up to his tombstone. Oh wow. It's cold, but I don't give a shit. Don't give a shit. Silence, your passenger remains immobile. Tonight it was too cold out, so Uber called you. And I'm gonna go upstairs. I'm gonna get in bed. Think about Dan. Think about those assholes. Those sons of bitches. Those shitbags. He stares at you. I want only one thing for them. Death. Okay. Eyes open. Fear right down to their veins. Their pants filling with... He hands you a bill and gets out of the taxi. You watch him staggering to his building for a minute. The main door is broken in. He doesn't even enter a coat to open it. After he disappears, you sit for a moment to contemplate the deserted street. Something about his story is off. You have trouble picturing a man his age climbing the wall of a cemetery. You saw that wall. It was at least two or three meters, maybe more. You turn the key in the ignition and drive away. At first, I thought that I was going to say no. I'm sure he's not. 
our guy because he's so he's so wrapped up in sadness about the loss of his of his grandson but and in the end it could have been you were perfect with anita oh i was nice I don't know, so maybe it is. <laughs> I introduced Leia to Ethiopian jazz, nice. We changed some life today. Yeah, I've met Francois. And I've met Patricia. And Patricia dropped me her number. Yep. You got her number. Oh, yeah, because I had to, because I could choose if I pick it up or leave it. So I think that must have been everything with With Patricia that we could have done. I think it was only three points You warmed Alexandra up. Oh, I noticed an envelope. Nice new evidence. Okay, ooh, we have new stuff to read. Well then, we are going to take a look at those in the next episode. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.